If you've ever wondered how a piece of public art gets built, first there's a design competition, then there's a winner, the design gets developed, the sculpture gets fabricated, and then it gets installed. If you'd like to know more about this, continue watching the rest of this video. Thank you. You know, this idea that things start with a drawing, it's amazing how important it is to commit to your idea on, in pencil. There's a part of your brain you use that you just can't, it's not the same thing as starting to design in the computer right away. The top of the trout's head is 20 minutes. Which is probably by, towards the bottom of that flag. When you meet with your clients, you have to, uh, it's sort of a balancing act because it's not entirely everything that you think you're doing. It's also, you have to be respectful to the site, to what the clients are hoping to see. You can't just walk in there and think you own the place. The first stage of this project actually happened in my studio and I started to fabricate the six body sections that would later be uh, powder coated the six different colors to create the rainbow trout. Each section started out as flat sheet metal that was then laser cut. This was structural stainless steel that was reinforced. All this would later on would be uh, taken to the large-scale fabrication shop and integrated into the final piece. Really interesting was we were able to take all this information and translate it into the floor. So we sort of have this floor blueprint that shows all the positions of the pieces as they would be in space. These are pre-finished in the studio. These are, this will eventually get welded inside of that little hole. There's screws so they can come off. And then we'll, uh, when we transport this piece, these get added on at the very end, just when we uh, install the sculpture. So that line runs through the edge of this piece of duct tape. That piece of duct tape reflects that. And then we were able to hang those pieces from the scaffold and they uh, line up according to the math. It said that they would be this high, this far apart. And when we went to the sweet spot, it lined up with very little adjustment. So again, that's where the computer came in handy. We had to build the sculpture from the top down. And we would suspend the pieces of the trout from a scaffold and then we would erect the stainless steel pipe uh, sections, which is the, the real support of the piece, had to be erected after that and fitted to the pieces. And we try to weld as much as we can uh, while the whole structure is up in place. You do as much welding as you can in situ. Again, some of these pieces had to go up and down ten times before they fit. These pieces have to be all hand fitted, so we were up there marking, bringing the pieces down, trimming a little off, bring the piece back up, see if it fits, and then repeat if it doesn't fit. We got better and better at this, and uh, faster and faster, and that's when I started to really like the material because it stopped being a struggle. And of course you have to wear all kinds of respirators and dust masks because the, these materials are actually, stainless steel is actually a hazardous material. My yellow hat. I've got three different colored hats, one yellow, one gray, and one green. Jeff and Dylan took the gray and green ones, leaving me with the yellow one, and then we discovered that yellow meant rookie in the shop. It's probably a good idea because that meant everybody had to look out for me because apparently yellow hat means I'm potentially dangerous. When we're looking at something in the computer, everything looks really simple and easy and uh, something that you can deal with. 
when we first arranged the head of the trout at 21 feet, uh, I was amazed at how big that actually felt in the shop. Uh, the, the sculpture was much more impressive uh, in reality than it, than it seemed to be on the computer. It, you know, it takes three people each time and a crane to move each one of these pieces into position and checking and fitting and checking and fitting and, and welding extra little plates on there so that we can clamp things. Round pipe is really hard to hold pieces against. When we first saw the materials when they were first delivered, the, the real fear I had was how, how easily are these things going to be to handle. We have to lift them with cranes. They're, never, they're not like straight pieces, they're off balance. So at the beginning, I was really terrified of the material and my fears that it would be impossible to work with. By the end of the process, a few months later, I'd actually fallen in love with the material. And the finishing part of it, of course, was very difficult. Stainless steel, the welds were big. They had to be really big, but you had to grind back a lot of that material. Just the labor involved uh, was more than I had expected. We think always that we can give things a quick buff and they look nice, but 750 hours later of grinding and destroying three grinders and all of us going at it, um, again, there's a certain amount of surrender to the reality of the difficulty of the material. This is uh, Nick Bercy, the engineer, and here we're looking at the connection points between two pipes. The, the, the waveform structure would actually be in three sections. So we had to design it so that it could be broken down into three pieces and then bolted together on site. And we're uh, looking at everything for real this time because up until now it's just been drawings and he's saying it's okay. Delivery day. And it's a wide load, so now you have to hire people with vehicles to follow behind this thing, and of course it costs a whole lot more money to get the thing to site. And you're so happy when it arrives in one piece. It's a bunch of pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And of course you have to hire a truck with a crane and he's going to stand around at hundreds of dollars an hour while you figure out what you're doing next. But it's so fun to play with the big toys when it's finally time to start lifting and moving things. We, we had already had the holes uh, pre-cored to depths of up to two meters on site and these sculptures have holes that will slide down into those holes and later be filled with concrete to lock the sculpture in place. And today's the day we find out if everything's actually going to line up on those holes and uh, if the framework is uh, also going to line up to the sweet spot. So this is the most nervous day of all because you have between five and ten people working at this point and delays cost literally thousands of dollars. Of course, arriving on site, you'll find out that the people who are there to do things for you um, do not always understand what you have in mind, and they did a bunch of things that we had to undo. This has got to go. we got to pull this on too. Uh, I'm tempted to cut so I to cut this here to pull this out. But the thing is, once the sculpture's in, we can't get the sauna tube out. So here we are tearing things out, fixing them. I can just cut that off, move okay. it back, that's no problem. And then we can get this dead yeah. center yeah, for you. So you have to be prepared to uh, adjust on site, let's say. So we have the wire, I have it in the, in the yeah. transformer We're there. And seven strands. Yeah, are you doing that? I was told that you wanted to do that no, or? I changed my mind. Very good. Yes, yeah. <laughs> not a problem. I understand. Then we'll fish our wire up and we'll, yeah. we'll grab it. Excellent. 
at the top. Yeah, very so good. we might yeah. cut a piece onto it, a little extension. And this is the electrician. We had designed this thing without the electrician around, but now we're getting together for the first time and figuring out how we're going to run power into the sculpture. So I got my 120. All we got to do is flip a breaker and you got your, uh, you got your juice. There's all kinds of crazy ways to do things. We had different fittings anyway. Uh, in the end, he decided we didn't need the fittings. He would just run this pipe straight into it. No problem. We'll deal with that after. The steel cages which fell apart, we had to fix them because you have to have them ready. These things need to be trimmed and fitted. The reach on this crane is actually extraordinary. This is the first piece being lifted. It's hanging at a crazy angle right now, so to get it lining up over the holes, we we're going to have to sort of manhandle it a little bit, but he didn't put it down and rebalance it. He just, ah, oh, let's give it a try. So here we are coming in at an angle. But lo and behold, it worked on the first try, so that just made our day go a lot easier. And then the second piece comes in, and you can see the bottom of them, the, the bolting plates that once those connect with the bottom of the other piece, the, the two sections would be bolted together. And little tweaks here and there, and thank goodness everything's lining up on the holes. And you can see how they would rest on top of the plate, connect together. And all these bolts and attachments in the end, once we pour the concrete, they're going to be underground and never come apart again. Of course, Jeff discovered that there's a little bit of extra weld between the two plates that was interfering. We had to grind off on site. You can also see that the, there's two pipes, they're conduit pipes that were disconnected there. They had to be fitted and then welded together on site. And that's a special kind of welding, that's TIG welding, so we don't make a big mess. Easy to clean up. I feel like I'm the, the ass end of a horse costume. And I think that's our first realization that things are starting to line up. These cans have been powder coated, but you smack into them or handle them the wrong way. If they get a big ugly scratch now, there's no way to fix it. And you can see the cardboard sort of taped to the back of the piece so that it wouldn't uh, get a scratch when we were installing it. We rehearsed this already in the shop a couple of times before we came onto site. We had one complete rehearsal of the full assembly of the sculpture on, in the shop, just to make sure that everything fit. And you can see that the eyelets are attached to the crane right now, to that piece of the same eyelets that we were hanging the pieces in the shop. Once those eyelets are removed, there's a hole there. We fill it with silicone. You can see the internal LED lights, which is a light strip. That light will then reflect off of uh, plexiglass 
interior that's, that's, that has a frosted finish on it, and that's how the light will come through the sculpture to reveal the image of the trout at night. Yeah, yeah I just got smacked while we were looking at what we're doing. Now you can see Jeff too, he's, he's always making sure everything's ready for the next thing that I have to do. And that's when you know you're working with the right, right people because they know everything needs to happen in a certain way and, and to be efficient, he's not just standing around, he's always thinking about what's going to happen next. Of course, the clients just happen to be there for the day to watch you, no pressure. You better hang around while I'm polishing. The spheres were cold connected on site. A couple of screws. A few final welds. So this is also going like clockwork. So we're, we're there at a certain time. The crane is there at a certain time. The electrician is supposed to be there at a certain time. And then the concrete guys show up at a certain time. And everybody has to, to arrive at, this, at different times. Hi. Smile. And we have to have everything ready uh, for each crew as they show up. You heard something today, Dylan? but everything's happening now, including dead battery. <laughs> we needed to get the concrete in right away because the way the sculpture is sitting now, if a heavy wind came up, there was a slight possibility it could knock the sculpture over. So we only wanted to have uh, only an hour between the time we got the fish pieces up and the concrete was settling. And if worse came to worse, we'd all stand on the thing and weigh it down, but... We always take a foot shot. That's a tradition. And of course the electrician has to get all the wiring done and all the lights have to work before we start putting the faces on. And they're held together with lots of little screws. And the crew is doing exposed aggregate around the footings. And of course the face of the trout is actually made of aluminum, in this case, backed with plexiglass so it was light enough for us to handle. And it's heavy gauge 1 8 plate, so it's very strong. So this, this whole fabrication thing you see on site was two days. And then the finishing was three more days. I can do that. Landing with two drinks. This is not an official thing. This was, we wanted to come out at night and just see what it looked like for the first time in the dark. Oh, beautiful. So this is everybody's chance to discover what happens when the lights are turned on and the sun goes down. Georgia, print it on stickers. Oh, oh, no. Rainbow yeah. trout yeah, and put them on the top. And everybody wants to hear what you have to think. And the funniest thing is that up until now, you may not have thought about it as much as you think you have. It's when you see it for the first time as a large physical object that ideas start coming to your head about what it might be. And the sweet spot where it lines up for cars, they're right over the water when the fish yeah. lines up too. And two whiskeys later, my artist statement would be complete. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready for a reality check. 
I can hardly wait for the day when I will stand in this river fly fishing with this in the background. I we retired today. I sat down and looked up and thinking, holy crap, what a spot. On these solar pipes, we have carbon. carbon. In creating NMAX Park, our desire is to promote a sense of community spirit while also promoting a connection to the beautiful outdoor spaces in our city of Calgary. Calgary Foundation Crossing is indeed a special place, a crossroad, where the beauty of art, nature and the spirit of our people intersect and our citizens can connect. With emphasis on metal, he is best known for bodies of work as suits of armor for cats and mice, armor ties and sword-handled briefcases, rocket lamps and pulp culture ray guns, and exquisite high art abstract works called exoforms. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff DeBoer to tell you a little bit more about this exquisite piece. Uh, quite wisely, they told me this morning I only have three minutes. Uh, I remember as a, as, a, as a child growing up, my father taking the family, said, I'm going to show you something, and we all hopped in the car, and we drove to the stampede grounds, and we saw the giant Union 76 sign that my father had built, which became an icon in the park for years and was a gathering point. So last week, it was exciting for me to grab my parents and say, let's go down to Stampede Park, I want to show you what I made. People ask me, how long did this take to make? an incredible sequence of events have to take place in order for something like this to occur. You have to have a beautiful site for a sculpture to begin with, and then you have to have what amounts to an enlightened jury that makes a really good decision. <laughs> Originally, I actually submitted a different idea for this sculpture, and I brought a model of this sculpture which I had created 15 years ago. There I am talking about this other idea, and I don't think they're listening to, any, to me anymore, and this is what they want. I cannot make this. We can. This takes all of us to do something like this. So I would like to thank, first of all, the members of the jury and Calgary Stampede for uh, giving me this opportunity. Definitely intuitive. You guys are not normal engineers. Uh, <laughs> Every engineer you say, I want to do this, and they, mm, they're like, oh, it's no problem. The components for the trout were built here in my studio, but the large-scale fabrication, I had to go to Plains Fabrication, and I'm excited that uh, representatives of Plains are here today, and the people that worked on it with me. Um, you guys are absolutely first class. Uh, thank you so much. This is as, as much a product of the kind of industry we have in Calgary and the kind of spirit that we have around fabrication in the city that's absolutely world class. Um, and then there's the, there's the crew. Young, apparently your last name's not pronounceable, so I'm not going to go there. Um, Dylan Padue was my apprentice. Dylan held a grinder and ground for two and a half months. So thank you, Dylan. Uh, uh, Jeff Storwin Kowalski and his son Hefner were also uh, millwrights and fabricators who worked on the project with me. This is maybe our seventh or eighth sculpture together. Thank you, Jeff, for everything. Uh, Scott Martin, thank you for grinding. Uh, Robert and Christine, thank you for the original design work. Robert uh, did the original uh, concept designs with me and we built the sculpture virtually so we could fly around and see it and rearrange things. Uh, Nathan Armstrong, I think you're here today, uh, did all of the uh, CAD work design and made sure that everything could be engineered. The, there is at least 30 or 40 people involved in this project. This is a Calgary made project, Calgary artist, Calgary crew, and all that money was spent here, uh, certainly during a recession. It's kind of nice to employ people in the industry. And a beautiful space, and I hope that the public enjoys it because it's got really good karma. Thank you. And of course, all the guys you work with on at Plains, they want to have their photo taken. I think it's great. The whole crew. Yeah, you should be in front, Stan. Stunning. This is the core crew. The guys who suffered the most. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't it? It's
so it turned out okay. Yeah. So, oh, I get back. It's not like you're getting it back. <laughs> yeah, but, oh, fuck. My dad's so happy. Oh, that's great. Yeah.